So um, the title of my slides in my presentation today is Shift Happens Through Strategic Actions. And the reason for that is in Texas, where I live, there has been a lot of uh, conflict between our state government and the federal government for years regarding the implementation of inclusive education and what it means and how it's defined. And so there's been a lot of preconceived notions about what it was supposed to be. There's been some, some fallacies there that, that the governments have not really aligned at the federal and local and state levels real, real uh, uh, collaboratively, which is kind of, I think, hurt in some ways. But then also, you know, we've had these perceptions that we can do better. And so now we currently are going through kind of a revamp of a lot of what we're doing here regionally in Texas, but also throughout our state. So uh, just real quick learning objectives. We're gonna just briefly touch on preconceived notions regarding you know, individuals with disabilities. Sometimes I use the word differing abilities by no mean am I saying that you know, for those who identify with you know, having a disability that that's not a good thing or that's wrong or that's not. It's just you know, I really believe in focusing on possibilities over the things that we have been told we cannot do. So then also we're gonna look at some of those perpetuated fallacies um, and you know, really inherent in the US inclusion movement. Um, a lot of times uh, policies will pass and they have, they're have they well intended, but there's some of these unintended consequences that come along with those. And then we get to those strategic actions. Uh, at the bottom of the slide you see there's, uh, in the, there's a, the word slide to the left bottom column and then there's a link there to these slides uh, a bitly if you wanna access these at a later date. So just quickly, uh, what you see on this slide uh, in the top left, I wanna move my face across the screen, is uh, just an image of the United States. Um, and I did this just to give you a representation of kind of where I'm coming from. And right in the middle of uh, the, the, the southern kind of middle of the United States down at the bottom, right on the Mexican border is Texas. And, and everyone kind of knows of Texas, you know, there's, I guess the good, the bad, whatever you want to say. No, we don't all ride horses, but, um, but it, it, there is a lot of uh, untamed land still out here in Texas. So I work for a regional education service center in Texas. Um, and what we do is we connect, you know, a public school for the little bitties and up into the, to the uh, high school years and the junior high years is what we refer to it here, maybe ages three to uh, 18 or so. Um, for years I had worked in those settings and now I work for a regional organization that actually supports teachers and school systems to provide more inclusive opportunities for students as they come through those systems so that when they learn together and relationships are normalized and they graduate and go on into upper ed, they are more prepared, one, to be successful in college, career, and military, but also they're more likely to hire and work with one another because we've normalized those relationships. And so, um, you know, moving forward, basically the, the, the culmination of a lot of the research I've done really is focused on federal and state policies from 1975 really to 2020. Um, School-based administrators is the term that I used in the research that I looked at. We really looked at, in Texas, the impact that a, that a campus or a, a school principal um, can have on really the fidelity and the effectiveness of special services for students with disabilities. Um, and, and the negative side of that, when that person is not qualified and um, um, kind of that growth mindset uh, as an administrator uh, on those schools. And so we collected surveys from around the state, 125 um, um, uh, principals from these schools around the state of Texas. Um, and then we found that there's a shift going on. There's, we're, we're kind of going through this shift from procedural compliance where, you know, before the way the government would look at our schools and say, if we were doing a good job, it meant that you were following the rules and you were filling out the paperwork and we were, we were compliant in, and we could check the boxes. Well, we've now moved into what's called the effectiveness phase of, of education in the United States. And that applies to students with disabilities as well. Excuse me. So moving along, um, this is a snapshot from the research that I have done. And what we've seen in the United States is since 1975, since the uh, Education for All Handicapped Children's Act, which became um, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which is the paramount um, protecting federal law in the United States for individuals with disabilities in schools, is that we have these three entities, especially in Texas, for example, we have the United States Department of Education. They're kind of, they're, they're the big driver of policy. We have uh, the Texas Education Agency and there are our state agency. Um, laws flow through obviously from the federal government to the state and then we align those uh, sometimes and sometimes not, like I said before. 
Then you have regional education service centers, and that in the middle of the circle on this page is regional education service centers. That's where I land, and that's the work that I do. I work across the state of Texas to try to help innovate some of the practices in education to try to move some of the systems forward uh, by meeting uh, with policymakers down in Austin at the state capitol, but also um, coming back regionally and working with local education agencies, which are school districts and public charter schools in region 12. Um, and so basically what we've seen is we've went through these phases of implementation over the past 40 or 50 years when it comes to working with students with disabilities, starting out in the top left corner paperwork phase was from 1975 to about 1990. The efficiency phase was 1990 to 2001. Most recently, we've come out of what was referred to as the compliance phase, and now we have shifted in 2015 into the effectiveness phase. That's important for the most part because, you know, anytime paradigms shift, you always have some people that are kind of partly still in the last paradigm or that are operating uh, partly in the, the paradigm that we're, we're trying to enter into. So it's that law of diffusion of innovation. How can we kind of move the system forward without leaving people behind or pushing too far forward? So we're kind of balancing these, um, these phases right now as we, as, as we really shift into this new era of education in the United States, which means, you know, we have to kind of personalize education for each and every child. And what does that look like? It's not necessarily writing a specific plan for every kid, but how do we remove barriers up front that's why UDL, I think, is picking up such a, uh, a kind of a groundswell here in the States these days. Um, so some of the preconceived notions, you know, one of the things in the United States that, that research will tell you is that, you know, Taylorism basically is where, where we all created uh, these wonderful factories and they allowed us to move into the industrial age and, and have livable incomes. And, you know, but we've shifted from that now. We, we're no longer, you know, in the United States, we're no longer a, uh, you know, factory um, country, despite what some people will try to argue uh, without getting political. Uh, but so, you know, the, the reality is humans, you know, were many years ago deemed either normal or abnormal based on whether you were somewhere under that umbrella of average. And so schools in the early 1900s really became these sorting systems and they, they wanted to sort out by brains. They would say, hey, this is a, a typical brain, an average brain. Good. Put them over here. They can be uh, workers in the factories and these brains over here, these are gifted brains. Let's put them over here. They could be our managers and and these brains. No, they don't operate like the others. So for many years in the United States, we had kids who were really excluded from from public education until 1975 when public law 94142 really created these parallel systems, general education for kids who had been in the system who were deemed not to have a disability and then special education for kids that were deemed to have a disability that qualified for special services. Now, this rocked along for a time, time here in the United States, but we finally realized now what happened is we, when you have these parallel kind of dueling systems, a lot of times you're gonna have, it just inadvertently, you just create the system of haves and have nots. And so that's what we're struggling with in the United States right now is how can we reimagine some of that? And we've really moved pretty heavily into kind of a medical model of treatment um, in which, you know, you know, in some ways it inhibits general educators from really feeling competent to work with kids that are more involved because our state certifications and our national licenses and things like that say, well, you're not qualified to work with this kid. So, but, you know, I strongly believe every child has similar needs. It's just to varying degrees. And how do we wrap services around kids to really provide these needs? And I know this is a, a, you know, a secondary conference up into college and stuff, but everything starts down at that, that entry into a school system and how we normalize relationships. So in my research, I've realized that, you know, this term on the left, this is something I reflect on often when in trainings that I do, we include or we exclude. So it really is that simple. Um, unfortunately, so often we don't realize that our systems are kind of exclusive. Um, and so, you know, we've had these fallacies in place for years where, the state agency will pass policies in, in regards to federal policies and, and a lot of these, uh, these timelines here, you can go back through and we can talk more about that if you're interested. Like I definitely would love to follow up with, with anyone interested in learning more about some of the cool stuff going on in Texas to kind of reshape and reimagine these things. The main thing is I, I like to leave people with is differences never divide us. I mean, it, it's never about what makes us different that makes us weak. It's, it's, it's those beliefs and it's the blind spots that we sometimes re don't realize we have that divide us. And so the more we challenge those, the more we can move forward. 
So Texas is strategically acting right now. And uh, currently we are, we put together a statewide strategic plan that really looks at how do we shift the conversation from compliance heavy to outcomes heavy. You know, it's one thing to say, listen, we have to follow the rules. If you take the money from the government, if you get the funding from your, 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 your property base, things like that, like we do in the States, you have to fulfill your end of that contract. But the other piece is if we're 100% compliance system, but kids are not learning, something's wrong. And then we end up with adults that are not prepared for college, career, workforce, military, whatever it is that their options are. Um, and so, you know, my question is always, and this is something I've asked for years, is how do we refocus? You know, it's not that we need to throw everything out and start back over. It's not that everything's broken and we need to fix it. How do we just shift our attention? You can never focus on a problem if you shift your mind to a solution. And if you're focused on what someone might be able to do, the possibilities, tapping that potential in others, then that disability falls away. You know, when kids are raised with one another through inclusive opportunities from early child on, they don't see disability, they see friends. So that's a lot of the research that I'm looking in is how can we, you know, move from a compliance heavy system to one that, that really is currently a deficit model in, in the United States to one that really focuses more on possibilities and on, you know, what kids are capable of, micromotives, um, tapping kids, with different type of opportunities early on so that we can kind of un unleash their potential. Um, and so I'm a very global and abstract person, maybe it's the ADD part, but um, in my research, some of the preliminary findings, I think some of the big stuff that I found was, you know, when we looked at the, the, the study, one of the big takeaways was as administrators feel that they are, you know, their, their levels of self-efficacy, when they have higher levels of belief that they, they do have the ability to administer these types of programs. We also saw an increased um, belief or per perceived inclusivity on their campuses. And so I don't think you can you know, overlook that. So implications for practice, really we're looking here in the States and in Texas specifically where I look is, how can we flip our model, not throw everything out, but really start to focus more on the positive aspects, the potentiality in every individual and connecting to strengths, passions, um, project-based type of learning, uh, and in doing so, I think we're going to really untap uh, the future of our kids. The idea is, you know, no longer do we need to fit in and be like everyone else. We really need to help people stand out in, in the world. Um, inclusion cannot be ensued. It must ensue. I strongly believe that. So thank you guys for the time. I feel like I know it was like a kind of like a sprint. <laughs> No, John, I think you paced yourself really well there. You've said an awful lot in a very short space of time. Um, and you've touched off things that I suppose I, I'm like, you know, are, are still kind of cognizant in people's minds. You know, you've mentioned like about that progression from the pre preconceived notions. And I like that slide with the Taylorism leads to ableism thing. I think that's still like i mean you could have a whole webinar just about that in itself um and even with the pre preconceived notions i'm sure there's still maybe people out there who have ideas or set ideas not about people with disabilities and in terms of those kinds of people with disabilities what kind of support should they have and what kind of careers should specific types of people with disabilities kind of enter or not enter as the case may be so it's there they're still like so much to do in terms of you know helping people you know not only with disabilities but still helping you know those people with those pre preconceived notions of disabilities to kind of break those down as well so as now there's like so much support whether in education at the workplace and the place of technology is becoming more embedded in both education and work you know possibilities are just you know almost becoming infinite really about how people can be independent in so many ways. So, Absolutely. you know, so I think it's a, it's a quite a big topic. So what, what I'm going to do, I'm going to bring Christine in here and um, Christine will kind of um, help with the Q&A section. Brilliant. Cool. So we're just going to have Christine just on second now. There's just a small issue with sound. Oh, so sorry. That's there good. you are. That's good. Probably Ready. helps if you unmute yourself. That probably is always a, a key feature of the <laughs> webinars. You think I'd know that by week nine. Sorry about that. Thank you so no, I, much. I, that's normally me who does that. Yeah. So I, that, that. 
Um, yeah, thank you so much, John. I really, really appreciate learning more about your work. As you were kind of saying, I think when we were in cast together, it was great to kind of touch on some of that and then just to kind of learn a bit more about some of that research is fantastic. And you have a podcast as well, I think. I do. I have several yeah. podcasts. I have, uh, you know, one of my, my key drivers is that, you know, I love the, you know, nothing. What was the, the theme of your last sessions where it was uh, nothing about us without us or something like that? Yeah, the student perspective. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so that is the driving force. You know, I have um, three podcasts that I that I host. One is about special education, differing abilities and celebrating and really, uh, you know, really acknowledging the work going on around the state, the positive work. Sometimes we get down in the weeds. You know, we get down into the negative aspects of, of what can't be done or where the barriers are, the constraints or why we why we can't realize these opportunities. And so this uh, SPED Talk is a podcast I do that really is about leveraging kind of the positivity and the opportunity that's out there and showcasing that. And then the Destination Education podcast is really about, you know, what could education be? You know, like even thinking through the lens of what we're all experiencing globally right now with COVID-19, you know, we don't want to lose this opportunity to really look at how to you know, capture those silver linings right now because they're everywhere you turn. You know, we've all, we're all aware of the, the sad stories and I, I, you know, I have some of my own, but at the end of the day, there's always that silver lining. How are we, you know, how are we really capturing that and making sure we don't let this moment in time pass us by so that future learners really can become those expert learners that we, that we envision them to be. Um, and so then, and then the last one, the one I get the most excited about is my kids. I have a 13 year old 12 year old and 11 year old and they do their own little podcast called kids spin and they like to interview educators and kind of put them on the spot and ask them why you know just fun questions and so it's it's just a good way to uh dialogue and share passions and things like that absolutely the student voice is so important i think we definitely like you were saying touching on with your children and then as well we saw last week it's so important to kind of have that voice at the table and um, there's just a question absolutely. comes through here for you john um, it's mm -hmm. from uh, Lucia Venturi um, from Bridge Interpreting. Hi, Lucia. Um, so she asked, would you apply any particular tools or resources during transitioning from school to college for students with disabilities? Yeah, in the States, so w there are certain laws that, that, that are built around um, um, having um, equal rights to access to opportunity, things like that in the United States. Our special ed laws stop at public school when kids graduate, but we do have what's uh, referred to as the Rehabilitation Act, uh, Section 504 in the United States, which ensures that accommodations and things like that follow that child or that young adult learner into college. And so I, I feel like the most important thing for our students in, you know, in, in their, their early education years is we, they really have to become um, cognizant of who they are. You know, I mean, because at the end of the day, we want self-regulating individuals that can say, I'm struggling right now. I know when I use this tool or I use this approach, it helps me. So I think the more we can empower um, young adults to really understand, you know, what makes them tick? What do they struggle with? Where are their strengths and how do, can they overcome? You know, that's where I feel like the, the analogy of being a coach, being a facilitator, more than just kind of being that presenter of content these days. You know, my kids can pull up Google and find any answer to anything they want in the world. But at the end of the day, how am I guiding that learning process and guiding them to understanding themselves so that they can go out into college and different places like that. And I think failure, I think one of the best things we can do is let kids fail, you know, and, and be there to support them and pick them up. And, you know, we have an educational system in the United States that is highly standardized and we're chasing test scores that sometimes I think a lot of people disagree with, but at the end of the day, can a child, can a young adult, can a, can a adult who's leaving home to go to college, can they fall down? Can they get back up, dust themselves off? And, and are they developing that grit, that resilience they need to persevere in the world? And so I think just creating opportunities for people to take risks and to, you know, take the right risks on learning. And that comes from um, having administrators at all levels and leadership at all levels that really protect the learning environment of those that they're in charge of. Um, and then I suppose there's just another question here come through um, from, do we have a chance, uh, another opportunity? Sorry, Trevor, yeah, perfect. Um, so what pedagogies are being applied in your school? So I suppose, I know you oversee a, a lot of schools in your district. So even if you could talk a little bit about that, that'd be great. That's a, 
that's a great question. I won't be real long there. But so we have in, in the states, we have not one American model of education. We have 60 uh, models of education because we have uh, local control in all of our states. And, and then we have federal policy that are passed that we have to implement in each state. In Texas, we have locally elected school boards. I happen to serve on a school board as a school board trustee for the school that my kids attend. So we're kind of like locally elected politicians, I guess, even on the least political person you ever meet in your life. But, and then, so all that to say in Texas, we have standards, you know, we live in a standards era now where, you know, and so the pedagogies, um, what I've, we've seen is there's a, there's this huge uptick of alternate certified educators these days in our systems where um, people are not going through the pedagogical um, trainings they used to at the, at the university level like they used to. So we're having to circle back and retrain at the, at the uh, kind of in the center where I work at Region 12, the pedagogies because of federal policies that went so content heavy um, on, on math and, 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 and uh, reading and writing and those types of reasonings. And as a result, we've kind of had this narrowing of a curriculum in the United States. We're starting to see this kind of open back up and push back. It's like this pendulum that swings. But as far as um, specific pedagogies, because I'm not working at a, at the school level anymore. I'm working more state and and regionally. We don't we don't actually, you know, we don't really sell pedagogy <clears throat> so much as we just support their practice. And so, but more and more, what we're finding is the idea of professional development is kind of dead. Like it, 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 PD to me is, is going away. We need professional learning opportunities. We need embedded supports. We need coaching. We need, you know, it's those relationships you form with people that over time you, you know, you, you learn together, you grow together. It's not about me going in and telling somebody, Hey, you need to fix this. It's about me going in and saying, Hey, where do you think you are in this? And then through kind of sitting by that person together, we, we, I can leverage the knowledge I have to help those individuals better understand how they can move forward in their craft. And so, um, you know, there's a lot, I've got a lot of great books for people that are interested. If you're interested in some of the global ideas I'm talking about at the end of my slide deck, there's a link to destination education creations. And on there, you'll find links to lots of books and research and things that, uh, and, and, and different things I've created visuals things. And it's all free. Anyone who wants to use it can just take it, steal it and use it. You know, I don't copyright any of it. Um, at this point in my career, I just am about pushing good stuff out to people. But um, and then sorry, all my John, is that sorry, John? Um, is that an online resource? It is. It's built off a of Padlet. Oh, okay, I, okay. Uh, but, um, so, uh, so uh, uh, that Padlet. Can you share that Padlet maybe on Twitter afterwards with oh, yes, the head? Absolutely. And Brilliant. I'll show it to you right here. I'll pull it up and show you. <laughs> and then I'll then I'll back out and stop sharing screen, <laughs> so you'll be able to see. Okay, so we can see the Padlet just, destination up there, padlet.com, jbullion1 yeah. slash KSN. Yeah. And I'll okay. share that on Twitter for you guys as well. Right. Brilliant stuff. That would be great. Well, John, thank you very much. You've given us tons of information there.